All right, let's talk a little bit about how the equipment is designed to help us minimize exposure both to ourselves and to the patients. So this comes from largely from the board outline A2, uh, minimizing patient exposure. So here's kind of an overview of what we're going to be discussing. We'll talk about tube housing, con the control panel, collimation, filtration. I, I expect you all to be able to calculate total filtration, so we'll talk about how to do that calculation. Um, the main objective for this section of learning is to be able to explain the various technical aspects of equipment design as it relates to radiation safety. Okay, So each part of our equipment, how does it help um, us reduce exposure, make sure that exposures are reproducible, that exposures are linear. We'll talk about what that means. Um, what image receptors, what part image receptors play in uh, exposure, um, and I mean exposure to the patient, um, the grid, and we'll talk about fluoroscopy. And then I think at the very bottom of this is uh, like special considerations like pediatric imaging. Okay. So the tube housing. Um, is <clears throat> lead lined, right? Um, and if any, I'll pick this thing up real quick. But the reason it's lead lined is it needs to be able to minimize um, any kind of leakage radiation, right? Does anyone want to see how heavy this is? Is anyone interested in holding this thing? It's heavy. Um, this whole encasing around it is lead. And then there's a very small window on it that permits the beam. And the reason for that is because x-rays are produced isotropically. They go out in all directions from the anode. Um, so when we're measuring at a distance of one meter from the x-ray source, we don't want leakage to exceed one milligray in air per hour. So that's very, 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 very small. Um, Basically, we should be able to hug the x-ray tube and make an exposure and not expect to get much of, a, of, of any dose from it. The control panel. <clears throat> um, the control panel is where we're going to set all of the technical factors, right? Um, so like milliampere and peak KVP uh, are going to be selected and visually displayed. If for some reason you cannot visualize it on this thing that this is what you've set it's time to get a new control panel right you don't just keep on working with it um, it needs to be located behind a suitable barrier and we talked about what kind of barrier that is what kind of barrier is it that it needs to be behind lead, lead. and what do we call it that that barrier It's a secondary barrier, right? So um, it'll have a lead equivalent appropriate to that machine's energy level, and then it's going to need to have some kind of elbow to it um, to prevent scatter from reaching the operator. And then additionally, it's required for it to have a window that is, has a lead equivalent so that we can visualize the patient at all times while we're making the exposure. Because if the patient's moving all over the place, or um, if the patient needs assistance, we need to be able to get in there pretty quickly. Generally, the control panel is going to make some kind of tone or noise when we're making an exposure, okay? Um, and that, again, is consistent with making sure that um, we're making appropriate decisions with technique and things like that. It's very helpful for us to hear that tone and know, oh, wow, that sounds weird. That sounds a little bit too long. Maybe I just need to turn this thing off. Um, collimation. Here is a really nerdy mnemonic I came up with. ACB, always collimate the beam, right? Um, when, when we're setting <clears throat> our technical factors, um, When we're, when we're thinking about collimation, um, we need to be thinking about these aperture diaphragms. So how this thing moves, I'll pick it up real quick and show you what I'm talking about. 
Um, so this is like an automatic collimation device or whatever. As I move these little things here, it's going to move these guys up top. All right, y'all probably have seen this, but it just helps me to look at it. Inside of it also has a mirror. All right, the reason it has a mirror is because there's a light field that comes out of this thing that shows us relatively where those lead shutters are at. Now the important thing about that is we need that mirror to be angled appropriately, right? Otherwise it's not really telling us anything useful. And so we think about two things when we think about the light field, right? There's luminance, right? Which is the amount of uh, brightness to that light beam, right? And <clears throat> and we have a number of ways that we can measure that, but we just know that it needs to be bright, bright enough to visualize, right? Or certain state licensing bodies can say, you need to change the bulb or something. But probably more important to, than that, for our purposes, has to do with coincidence, right? So is that mirror lined up appropriately? Does the light field actually show us the area that's being exposed, right? And if it doesn't, is it within a limit uh, of that's required by law? So what I have is the sum of the cross table and along the table alignment differences between the x-ray and light beams should not exceed 2% of the SID. Okay? What the heck is that talking about? It's talking about, whoa, let me get my little crayon. So it's talking about how much this light field relates to the actual area that is being irradiated, right? Um, so, for instance, a lot of times we, we do this measurement at 100 centimeters, right? Just because it makes the math easier. Um, but, so for 100 centimeters, <clears throat> 2% of 100 centimeters is 2 centimeters, right? So when we're looking at this thing, we're saying, okay, this would be like along the table and this would be across the table. So basically an X and Y coordinate, right? Let's say that this is 1, but this is 2. We no longer have appropriate coincidence, right? Because when we add 1 and 2 together, we get 3, and that's 3 centimeters, right? So that is more than 2%, right, of the 100 centimeters that we started with. Does that make sense? It is non-coincident now. So we would call that an aperture diaphragm because it has these little knobs that we turn and that changes the aperture of the window, right? Changes how big the window is. We can also use dia uh, collimators like cones or cylinders. Um, uh, we used to use, and I think they still do use cone-shaped diaphragms or cone-shaped collimators in, um, in, in fluoro, like when they're doing special procedures, when they're trying to visualize um, blood vessels within the brain, they use a cone-shaped um, collimator um, because you'll notice <clears throat> this little fella here is only collimating in a square shape, right? Now, we say, well, why can't you make a variable aperture cone shape, right, so that we get a circle, right? Well, if we think about it, this is collimating x-rays. So whatever device that we make that is able to collimate like this, it would need to be a very, very, very heavy device um, because we're going to have to fit together lead plates in a way such that it's blocking things in a cone shape. So it is both cost prohibitive and also engineering prohibitive to try to build that. So we just, we just take a little circle-shaped thing, stick it on, on there, and now we've got um, a, a, a collimation that's cone-shaped. Okay. So we mentioned that there's going to be these two sets of adjustable lead shutters. There's a light source and then the mirror. And this is just a quick review, but luminescence is the amount of brightness of that light field. Um, it needs to be visible, basically. Um, coincidence, we have said that it needs to be 2% coincident. 
right? Um, and then positive beam limitation is now a requirement for any machine made after, let me see. So some earlier collimation systems in radiography and actually some of our machines in there, you'll notice you can collimate, you can leave it open, right? Um, positive beam limitation um, prevents the mistakes of mismatch between that collimated field and the actual IR that we've placed out there to be x-rayed. So when the PBL is activated, the collimators are automatically adjust, adjusted to the radiation field so it matches the size of the image receptor. Um, every now and then people will turn it off, um, like if you have to do something that requires an angle or something like that. Most direct or digital radiography units have a PBL on them already, um, and there's really no way to change that. Um, filtration. Um, the main reason that we use filtration is to reduce the exposure to the patient's skin and superficial tissue. And it's going to absorb the lower energy photons, okay, that have a long wavelength, right? Long wavelength photons. And they're going to absorb them from that heterogeneous beam. Because when I set the KVP for 100, right, I know that the peak value of the x-rays produced is going to be 100, but then there's going to be a heterogeneous amount below that. There's going to be like a rainbow, right, that comes out of the machine. The very, very low energy parts of the rainbow I'm going to use filtration to remove, okay? So anything um, like 20 keV or lower, right, that would be a number probably worth remembering, that filtration... It's designed to uh, capture those low energy photons. And uh, does anyone remember what, how these photons are produced? The typically low energy ones are produced within the, within the x-ray tube. So Bremsterlong is going to create our more high energy photons, right? Photoelectric happens within the patient. This looks very similar to photoelectric, though. Coherent. So coherent scatter, right, produces some low energy photons. Um, and here is the equation that we need to memorize. Total filtration equals inherent filtration plus any added filtration, right? Um, so what we know <clears throat> is that this relates to the energy of the um, x-ray tube. So the total filtration... Oh, let me see. So the KVP of the given x-ray unit, just like shielding, the filtration relates to the energy of the, of the machine, right? So there's a total filtration required of um, 2.5 millimeters for x-ray tubes operating above 70 KVP. So that's pretty much everybody, right? Um, and that's 2.5 millimeter of aluminum equivalent, right, aluminum equivalent, um, and because <clears throat> each x-ray tube typically, if it has a collimator stuck on the front of it, it's going to have some inherent filtration of about 1.5 millimeters of a, aluminum equivalent, right? So we want a total filtration of 2.5 so how much more do we need to add to it? One. One millimeter. Um, that's all I'm talking about. Now, a board question related to this is it might go ahead and tell you um, something like machines operating at 50 to 70 kVp require a total, a total filtration of 1.5, right? Um, regardless, I would go ahead and minimize the stuff that's in the book, I mean, uh, memorize the stuff that's in the book on page 230 um, related to filtration and different energy levels. Um, know that 2.5 is kind of the go-to, um, but we should probably know um, all of those numbers. For mobile and also for fluoroscopic equivalent uh, equipment, it, it's still that 2.5, Okay. I believe so. I also have it on this slide. Um, 
So 70 kVp is 2.5 millimeter. 50 to 70 is 1.5. Machines below 50 kVp, which is like dental x-ray machines, is 0 0.5 millimeter aluminum equivalent. And then mobile diagnostics, so our portable x-ray machines and our fluoroscopic equipment has that 2.5 again. 239. 239. Thank you, Emily. Now, um, part of how we arrived at these numbers has to do with half value layer, right? Um, and I, I don't know, I don't think I have a slide on half value layer in here. Let me see. Okay. Let's, well, let's work this problem real quick. <clears throat> For a machine capable of operating at 130 kVp, having 0 0.5 of added filtration, What's, what must be the inherent filtration of this machine? Two millimeter aluminum equivalent. Okay? That's how these problems will look. Right? And so expect a quiz question like this. Um, before I talk about exposure reproducibility, let me talk really quickly about half value layer. Um, and uh, this comes from some NCRP information. So half value layer is the thickness of a designed absorber, it's typically aluminum, right, required to decrease the intensity of the primary beam by half of its initial value. Why is that important? Um, the physicists are going to use this as they make their yearly measurements, right? Um, so <clears throat> they set that up with a table, and it's going to allow us to know what is the energy, what's the operating energy of this machine? So we're going to harden the beam and we're going to measure that hardened beam, right, by applying a half value layer. So for example, um, I believe this table is found on your book, but uh, in talking about half value layer, so it would be close to that filtration table, um, what we know is that for a machine operating at 120, the half value layer is um, 3.2 two um, millimeters of aluminum equivalent, 3.2 millimeters of aluminum equivalent. And so they're going to apply that kind of filtration, the physicist will, to the primary beam and make some measurements that let us know what the exposure reproducibility is, what the exposure linearity is. Is the machine capable of producing the kind of x-rays that it should be able to produce at that energy level, right? Um, Half value layer also relates to the pregnancy discussion that we had earlier. We are going to apply half value layers, the physicist will, when they're doing the calculation to understand what the fetal dose may have been. Okay? So exposure re reproducibility is just the consistency and output in radiation intensity for identical generator settings from one individual exposure to subsequent exposures. So we need to have a variance of 5% of less. So, so that means that for every exposure that I make at like 60 kVp at 5 mass, um, every single exposure should look pretty similar, right? I shouldn't be getting stuff all over the map. Exposure linearity is a little bit different. It has to do with how the machine circuitry is processing the power that we're putting through it. So as we change different KVP settings on the machine, um, but a compensate for mass, right, um, we want to see an exposure that's fairly linear. Um, that regardless of how we put in the exposure technique, um, the amount of x-rays that are produced is, is fairly similar. Um, and so linearity is just the mathematical definition of the ratio difference between exposure, millirankins and air, right, to the mass values, right? And it needs to be uh, less than 0 0.1. Um, so in, in other words, linearity cannot exceed 10%. These are ways that we ensure that our patient is um, receiving the kind of uh, exposure that we believe that they're receiving is by um, once a year uh, doing physics uh, calibrations on it. Um, so some other technical factors just while we're still kind of at the operating console and thinking about these numbers. Um,
the technical factors that contribute to um, exposure has to do with the, with the mass per unit volume of tissue of the area that we're exposing, right? Um, the mass per unit volume of tissue of the area of clinical of interest. This is on page 276 in our book, Technical Exposure Factor Considerations. What the heck is that saying? That's saying collimate. It's saying that exposure is directly related to the area of the area that was exposed. Um, the effective atomic number and electron densities of the tissue involved. That's talking about tissue density. It's talking about, in other words, it's talking about how dense is our, the patient, how dense is the area that we're trying to uh, see. The film screen combination or the types of image re receptors that we're using. Um, the SID, right? This relates directly to distance, inverse square law. Um, the type and quality of filtration that we're using, right? We want to make sure that we're using filtration that's appropriate to this machine. The type of x-ray generator, and that's one of the things that we're measuring when we look at exposure linearity. And then the balance of radiographic and density and contrast required for the exposure. All of those things have bearing on both the technique that we're using and patient dose. So let's talk a little bit about image receptors. <clears throat> the way a film screen combination works is most of the radiographic density is coming from the luminescence of the crystals within the film screen. That's why we use screens, right? So 95% of what's exposing the film is light. It's not x-rays. Um, a, a CR cassette in general is about the same as a 200 speed film screen combination, right? Um, and related to the film screen is we have a luminescent phosphor on some of these CRs that is capturing some of it and producing it as light, right? Grids. This is fairly re review material. But we know that when we use grids, we are, can, we are going to increase the patient dose, right? Um, so not using a grid versus using an 8 by 1 grid, we're talking about increasing the patient dose by three times, right? Um, so we should understand that the technical factors that we set are related to patient exposure, especially when it relates to grids. Now, grids make up for... Um, the increase in exposure by giving in us an increase in what on our image? Did someone say contrast? Contrast is definitely what I'm looking for. Um, right. Basically, these grids allow us to get an image that has a little bit higher contrast. Um, so although the use of a grid increases patient dose, the benefit obtained in terms of improved quality right, in the recorded image um, is it's a, it's a fair compromise. Okay, let's talk a little bit about fluoroscopy. Pulsed, when we use pulsed fluoroscopy, we're going to be able to decrease the patient dose, especially for the longer procedures, and it's going to help extend the life of the tube. Um, Anytime we increase KVP and filtration, we're going to reduce the patient radiation exposure rate. Why is that? How can increasing the KVP reduce patient exposure? Yeah. Yeah. When we're using a lower KVP, um, it's going to increase the patient dose because it's decreasing the penetrating power of the X-ray beam necess necessary to make the image bright enough to see it. So when we're, when we're using fluoro, we're going to keep the KVP pretty high because what's happening to the remnant beam as it exits the patient is it's having to go through an image intensification process. And if that image intensification process is not sufficient, the computer is going to go ahead and make adjustments to bump up the patient dose to increase that brightness, right? Big part of fluoro and particularly OR work is the SSD. What's an SSD? Yeah, source to skin distance. So it should not be less than 15 in inches for stationary. So those fixed fluoroscopes that we have on the table, they, you pull them out, they lock into place, and then we start to fluoro, right? 
And when we're using fluoro units uh, like a, that are mobile, particularly like the C-arm units, it, it shouldn't be uh, less than 12 inches, okay? And then there has to be a cumulative timer, um, and it has to be used. We cannot manually reset the timer, right, until it has gone off. We can then push the reset button. So if the surgeon asks, says, I hate when that timer goes off, we just quiet it, you're required by law to leave it on, okay? And that's largely just as a reminder. Um, it's just a, a, a physical reminder. So, <clears throat> entrance skin exposure rates of general purpose intensification fluoroscopy units, it's, it's going to have a maximum of 100 milligray in air per minute. Um, the wording on this may not be right, but the main thing that we need to know here is that when they come in and they do their measurements on fluoro machines, they're making sure that it does not go above 100 milligray in air per minute. If we're using, if we're looking at a machine that's capable of HCL or HLC, I'm sorry, um, they can have uh, entrance skin exposure rate greater than that. Okay. And again, the reason for that has to do with it being able to operate at a higher KVP range, right? So even though the exposure rate is higher, the energy level is higher as well. So more of it's passing through the patient. Um, the interesting thing about magnification in fluoro is that it's going to increase the MA and it's going to increase the patient dose, right? The way that magnification works in these machines <clears throat> is it's setting a pivot point within the intensification tube, right? And so if we're talking about a one-to-one, -one, it has a pivot point like right in the middle. If we try to magnify it, it's going to bring that pivot point um, closer in, right, so that it can magnify it. So now we have like a one to two, right? When it does that, <clears throat> it's going to need to increase the dose going through the patient because as this magnifies out, we're going to lose some of our information, right? So it's going to increase the MA and raise the patient dose so that it can have the same brightness level when we magnify it, okay? So magnification increases patient dose in fluoro. Last image hold is a dose reduction technique that can be used with some of these older, like some of these newer digital systems. Um, so we didn't have it with the older systems, but now what it can do is it can average an image together out of the last few images, right? So it can use a lower dose rate um, to reduce, but at the same time reduce quantum noise by using a computer to average and come up with an image um, that's a composite of all of those images over the last second or so, right? So that's last image hold. So, in general, <clears throat> the main areas that are going to increase our risk for exposure occupationally and also patient exposure is general fluoro, interventional procedures in any modality, particularly in CT or in x-ray, mobile exams are a big part of where our dose comes from, um, and then C-arm fluoroscopy, right? These are the things that we're looking at that have, um, that pose a risk for us. In terms of trying to reduce those risks, here's ways that we can try to reduce them. And this comes from our textbook on page 3, 312. Avoid repeat exams. Anytime we repeat the exam, we've just doubled the patient dose. Um, remember that the patient is a source of scatter radiation. Right? Um, practice proper filtration. So making sure that our physics department is up to snuff on how well the machine is producing linear and reproducible exposures and how well that filtration is working. Wearing protective apparel. It's kind of a no-brainer, but there's people who forego it. Um, considering these exposure factors, are there ways, particularly like in fluoro or in general x-ray, that we can um, make sure that our exposure factors are appropriate? 
especially now that we're in a digital world and we, we know that what we know about dose creep is very real, um, it is helpful to make sure that we're using appropriate techniques. Um, using high-speed image receptor systems, especially in film, and then any like correctly processing radiographic images. So making sure, like, if y'all remember, what was it back earlier this summer, we didn't have appropriate chemicals in our developer, and it was not developing our films appropriately, right? This was a big deal back in the day, was all of a sudden you could lose detail to just the processing process, right? Okay, and that is it. This is um, a website that I found where you can purchase anti-radiation protection sleeveless maternity dresses with an anti-radiation belly brand that's included for free in either navy or dark red. I have no clue if this is true, but I suspect that it is totally bogus. Um, it doesn't say that her cardigan is radiation reducing, which is what makes me think that maybe this is some kind of... I don't know. It's like um, when I was in South Korea after the avian flu thing, everyone, they were wearing stylized um, in, in 95 masks. Like they had N95 masks with like studs on them or Hello Kitty or rhinestones, you know, and it, w it had become a fashion accessory. Um, so I think that after Fukushima, these um, radiation reducing, anti-radiation maternity dresses are probably big now in, in Japan, is my guess.